180 murders uh, in New York City, and amazingly, they did try us as the default as the default representation to show you as though they all happened at the same time. It makes it makes you look like a truly terrifying. It doesn't be insane to live there, except just 8.8 million people were insane enough to live here, right? Now, obviously, this doesn't rep this represents nine, maybe six years of New York City, right? And if you were to pick any given day, you might find one, you might find two, and you look at it, you'd say, "What? Oh, it looks like fantastic, right?" Now, they have a little disclaimer at the end of this where they're saying, you know, oh, it's really difficult to figure out what's going on, and finally the status and details on certain deaths may happen months after they occur, and tracking those is difficult. Yes, it's called journalism, guys. <laughs> That's the name for it. <laughs> it's like finding out what happened and sort of keeping track of the story, but no. Um, and so we're, you know, you begin to see how the, the sort of substitution of these sort of interactive techniques and systems actually allows journalists to stop being journalists as they would have traditionally been conceived, and then to present these extremely ideological representations of New York City. And remember as well, when you look at the map of New York City, you're above it, right? And no one lives up there at all, right? So if you were to sort of zoom down into that New York, you'd see a very different version of it. Now. There's other ways in which these kinds of things are very socially regressive as well. Um, you know, it's 2011, we should be a little bit past like sort of like really primitive racial discourses and pretty, really primitive gender discourses toward a sort of much more complex understanding of the city and the world that we actually live in. But if you look at this, if you look at the legend for the map, they say, okay, race, ethnicity, sex, age. Like absolutely boring demographic categories. Um, this is really a disaster. This is really a disaster. This is not a substitute for a sort of like sophisticated um, sort of decoding of what the stories are. So I'll zoom in a little bit to sort of one particular area of Northern Manhattan to show you what they represent. Right. So here's this is all the murders or something like that. Um, now if we were to zoom in again, we'd see a very different picture. We would see actual buildings, the various heights. We'd see parks. We'd see all the sort of setbacks and sort of little details like the correction service department. Yeah. Um, you know, you'd see a much more differentiated world where you'd be, you would be able to understand maybe why there had been a murder there, right? As opposed to in Harlem ah! or something like that. And what you'd see is a sort of, is, is again, this is a, a vision, this is a sort of informatic construction of, of the city, but still it's, it's much more subtle. I and mean, you might also see, for example, that in some of these cases, these murders took place in private environments, like apartments and things like that, 16 stories up, and that they represent absolutely no public threat at all. Um, when you look closer at it, you'll see something even stranger, which is that with the one, one exception down here, there was not a single murder that was between 2003 and 2009 that took place in a park. Now, this is absolute rubbish from beginning to end, and it took me the longest time to figure it out. And that's because there are no addresses in parks, so they can't put a murder, they can't visualize it as taking place in a park. Because it turns out that these are all based on police reports, right? And the police, depending upon how you feel about it, um, if you have questions regarding police activity, you might want to run downtown uh, these days and see what's happening down there. Uh, but you know, it's, if you've ever called up to report a crime, you know, you'll say, hi, I saw something, and they're like, what race is he? And you're like, well, it's more complicated than that, I don't have time, what race is he? It's a very regressive way of kind of trying to sort of like, you know, define, define and construct the city. It's really terrifying. I'm sure that they've gotten better since I've done that. But basically what you'll see is it, it's a very sort of strange um, version of the world, and not in any way accurate, and yet it's presented as being very accurate. Um, here finally is one detail that I want to present that I was actually able to track down, which is this poor homeless guy, Mohammed Afzal. Um, interestingly, Hispanic male, right? I mean, there's a lot of things that might not necessarily seem to add up here. The blue dot shows where they say he died. The red dot is where he actually died. I actually managed to sort of track this one down. And so you see that is that is that he was he's, he's sort of homeless in death as he was in life. That he's homeless even on a sort of symbolic on a symbolic level. That even the simple dignified act of representing where he really died has been displaced because it's not convenient for the purposes of a database or something like that. But each one of these dots, and the dot is right, is one of the sort of like the hermetic image of modernity, right? It's a way of describing an event that has no kind of odd details or sort of, you know, rough, you know, messy edges or something like that. The moment that you lift up one of those dots, what you'll find are all kinds of racial discourses, gender discourses, class discourses, cultural discourses, political discourses, linguistic discourses will come crawling out like it's a manhole, like a 
ch you know, chud. And basically what you see is like most of the progressive politics of, the, of like the 20th century in America and before are buried under those dots. They've been hidden. And this really is my fundamental point in sort of thinking about what information visualization or informational images is. Don't believe it. These are aesthetic representations of aesthetic representations of aesthetic representations. And there's so many layers on top of this that it really becomes impossible to understand what's going on unless you realize that they are absolutely political, absolutely ideological from the get-go. Okay. Do any of you know the Mekons? We got one, okay. The Mekons is a sort of pre-post-punk band. They're the sort of endless experiments. Um, quite fantastic. This is from a very beautiful song that they put out, I think, in 1991 that describes this kind of uh, stratospheric ascent away from the cares of the world off into a sort of a, a sort of a, you know, a carefree world in which you sort of, in this, sort of this, this, this sort of ascent is, is leaving behind the sort of woes exactly that I was just talking about. Um, I'm going to get a little trippy on you as well. But this is a beautiful image by a French artist, Odion Redon, uh, who was a symbolist, who believed, uh, sort of working around the turn of the century, who believed very strongly that his work was just a sort of like symbol of his beliefs and that it should not be interpreted in any way, sort of political or social way, that it was supposed to transport you. And very sort of fundamental to his idea of transport was this sort of combination of, on the one hand, relatively new technologies, but ones that are sort of you know, to sort of free you, but on the other hand, the sort of notion of visuality or something like that. It would be almost impossible to draw this now. Instead, this is what we get, right? This cataclysmic destruction of the Earth. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very similar visual form, but with absolutely different meanings. Absolutely, absolutely different meanings. Um, and in much the same way that in Renaud's world, they never could have conceived of something like this total kind of cataclysmic catastrophe that destroys all of the Earth. We can barely even understand that now, right? But both of these, both of these, ultimately operate on this sort of strange sort of spherical object drifting away from another spherical object and representing the world in very sort of delicate ways. Now, this is a little mashup that I made. On the one hand, is uh, is uh, the first part of the film, a sort of classic of modernist film called uh, Powers of Ten, made by the Ameses. On the right is all the sort of vertical footage from the film Enemy of the State. So basically, these two things are sort of, the, 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 the camera is operating in the same way in both of these images. Uh, it's sort of moving along the same different axis. But in this, which was made in 1968, and is widely heralded by the design crowd as being an absolute masterpiece, even though Disney was doing Monsanto, can't be Monsanto funded rides like in the same year, and like it was 10, 14 years after Incredible Shrinking Man, which is like a real masterpiece of campy sort of Hollywood <coughs> theater and an allegory for the shrinking sort of value of like, the white male in the wake of World War II, there she you know, this sort of stately sort of uh, ascent from the world. And on the left, you know, by the time we get around to the early 2000s or whenever it was that the, the enemy of the state came out, that you have this completely paranoiac reassessment of this same, of this same axis and what it means to operate on the same axis. So the one we have is sort of drifting away Right. And it, this, I think, allows you to look at sort of the, if you ever see or the next time you see um, um, the Ames's film, you really need to look at it in a very political context. The field that they're leaving from in Chicago is basically where the Chicago riots took place about two months before they took place in 1968, right? But here we have a sort of much more sort of freaked out status disjointed model of uh, on the right from any of the state. Um, it sounds like I'm sort of making sort of very sort of vague and sort of, you know, sort of long-winded and sort of complicated, you know, um, theoretical arguments, but at the same time, they can be absolutely concrete. Um, the la these are two things that I drew up using Excel, right? Just it's exactly the same data, but I just put minus signs uh, for the second one. On the left, you'll see that there is no ceiling. Things just go up and up and up. There's nothing to restrain this incredible growth. On the right, there's a shadow at the bottom. There's a floor. Right. And so you'll see, and this is the result of a very deliberate part of, you know, sort of like study on the part of like organizations like Microsoft. We exist, we have to exist in a world where there's a floor, but we can't stand the other. We can't stand not having a floor. We have to enclose that space, but the ceiling can go on forever. Um, I think I'm going to skip that. Unfortunately, I really don't have time for this beautiful passage by Walter Benjamin based on this quote. But, uh, uh, and I'll end here, because this is a really nice way to end. Hmm. 
Five. Hmm. And what are you doing? Well, I'm taking a course in visual thinking. It teaches you how to visualize your thoughts. What? Q. See that? Man, I need it to begin it. I'm an old head to just go, watch. Hey, a little watch. With movement parts, no less. Gee, have you taken this course already? No, man, I'm a natural. I've been doing it for years. What for? Well, I used to use it with my piano lessons to help me remember the music. I thought I could picture the music just by going, da, 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 da. Oh? Then I studied chords and I learned to remember them. Boom, boom, boom. Then came the more advanced music. Could not have seen it by Bach, Beethoven symphonies, all like this. The trouble was, I kept on advancing. And then I got interested in jazz. Oh, I don't like jazz. Jazz is a big It moves, see, like this. Oh, good, you pop it up, 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 that doesn't seem very dangerous to me. Well, jazz tends to linger and you can't get away from it. You go this way, or you go this way, and it stays right with you. Ah, oh, it bugs you then? Mmm, not bad. Yeah, it does. Well, uh, how do you get around it? Well, it may sound weird, but you're raised by saying backwards what you said forwards to make it in the first place. You follow? I'm confused. Well, in this case, I say, Oh, smooth, 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 smooth. That's wonderful! Do some more! Okay! And now you uh, take what you just said and turn it around. Right. Oh, dee 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 I forgot what I said. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's only getting rigorous. I know. I'm not saying the first thing backwards. I'm saying something new. Okay, try. You see what's going to happen, don't you? No, what? It's going to raise us. Oh, no. Yeah. Help. 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 <laughs> Okay, there you go.